Today we'll be today we'll be reading from Isaiah sixty. Um, verse one through six. Arise, shine, for your for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord ris- has risen upon you. For behold, darkness shall cover the earth, the thick darkness the peoples, but the Lord d- will arise upon you, and his glory will be seen upon you. The nations shall come to your light, and the kings to you the brightness of your rising. Lift up your eyes around about that you see. They are all gathered together. They come to you. Your sons shall come from far, and your daughters shall be carried in the arms. Then you shall see and be radiant. Your heart shall thrill and rejoice, because the abundance of the seas shall be turned to you, and the wealth of the nations shall come to you. A a multitude of camels shall cover you, the young camels of Midian and Alpha, and those of Sheba shall come, and they shall bring gold and frankincense, and shall proclaim the praise of the Lord. Now also from the New Testament, Matthew 2 through 12. Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judah in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east, and we have come to worship him. When Herod heard the king when Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. They told him in Bethlehem of Judah, for it, for so it is written by the prophet. And you, O Bethlehem, is the land of Judah, and no means least upon the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler, and who is governed the people of Israel. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly, and asserted from them what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for them, for the child. And whenever you have found him, bring me word that I too may have come to worship him. When they had heard the king, they went their way. And lo, the star which had seen in the east went before them till it came to rest over the place where the child was born. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going to the house, and they saw the child with Mary the mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. And opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, JT. I I can't speak for everybody, but I always find the hardest part of writing anything to be titles. Like, I'm terrible at figuring out what to call things, and I usually, I choose titles that I think are funny or clever, and they just wind up alienating people. I once, yeah, my wife's was nodding. My, I, once, I once preached, and not here, I once preached a sermon that I entitled Everything You Think You Know Is Wrong. I thought that was really clever. Everyone else found it insulting, and that was really the only thing they ever remembered about the sermon. I was going to call this one Three Myths and a Baby, but I was afraid that you would assume that I didn't believe that this had happened. Um, quite the contrary, I do. It's just that a lot of the things that people, most people, believe about this particular story simply aren't true. Um, You've seen, like, you know the scene, right? You know the story? It's a hundred Christmas cards. You've seen it in people's yards. Um, I love nativity scenes, by the way, like the the ones that people put up in their yards. Um, Sometimes there are some great ones. Years ago, when we lived in Carrick, the best one I ever saw. The best one I ever saw when we lived in Pittsburgh had Mary and Joseph and, and, and Jesus. It was fair enough. And on the one side was Santa Claus, and on the other side was Mickey Mouse waving an American flag. And they were all there in the manger. It was glorious. Um, 
most of the time, what do you see? You see, if they're not in the manger, you've got three kings on camels, right, kind of trudging across the desert um, under the, the blazing glow of a star. And uh, they, they introduce themselves. They arrive shortly after the child's born. They introduce themselves and offer three boxes to the baby. Just then everyone freezes in place, and there you go. You've got your Christmas card, right? Nice image, right? As it happens, it's also probably complete nonsense. If, I mean, if we take seriously what Matthew has to say here, Almost every detail is wrong. The Magi, they're not kings. We Three Kings is a fine song to sing at Christmas. They're not kings. They're not kings. They're, they're, they probably weren't three of them. The star probably wasn't what we think it is. I mean, just as a minor detail, they probably didn't ride camels. And they absolutely, positively, without a doubt, did not show up on Christmas morning. So what's the truth? Who are these guys? And why does it matter? What is it they were following? What were they looking for? And why does Matthew think this odd little story is important for us to hear? Well, we'll start with the first myth. Who these men were. Who these men were. In short, they're not kings. Not kings. They're actually something a whole lot more mysterious. They're magi. Magi. Uh, Matthew says that after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, magoi, magi, came from the, from the east, came to Jerusalem. Now, I believe that the translation that JT just read calls them wise men. Calling the magi wise men is like calling Henry Ford a car dealer. It's true, he sold cars, but he was a little more than that, right? Back in the glory days of the Persian Empire, say around Daniel's time, there was a tribe that lived in the central highlands of Persia, what's now eastern Iran, and they were called the Magi, and they, they, had their, they had a peculiar religion. Their religion centered on the, the study of fate and time. They, they believed that by studying the natural world, especially the skies, right, they could divine the cycles of history. In other words, they were trying to tell the future. They, they traveled the, Ro the world from Rome to China, in search of knowledge to help them tell the future. And in the process, all of this travel, all of this study, two things happened. One is that they actually became the finest astronomers in the ancient world. That's not what they were trying to do, but that they ended up being the people who knew the most about the skies, about the stars and the planets and their movements. They also, not coincidentally, became fantastically rich. Because in the process of traveling around to study, they were trading and opening up business relationships and all of this. It didn't help, or excuse me, it didn't hurt. It didn't hurt that the ordinary people regarded these guys as sorcerers. And you can kind of see why, right? These are, these are rich, powerful people who claim to be able to tell the future. And the ordinary people regarded them as wizards. And in fact, their name, Magi, comes into English via Persian and Greek as magicians. That's where we get the word magician. Now again, these guys are rich and powerful. I, it's, I said it's a minor detail about the camels. But based on our, our knowledge of the Magi, which isn't a lot, mostly from Herodotus, Greek historian, um, they, they tended to travel, they, they didn't, camels are for peasants, right? These guys had enough money to buy horses. And they bought and they bred fine Arabian horses. Sturdy little desert horses. And they traveled not in threes, because these were long journeys. They traveled 
in large caravans. They traveled with servants and cooks and grooms and wives and children and everybody, and they all traveled together. And oh, by the way, they were traveling through the desert, they're traveling through wilderness areas, and so they traveled armed because it's a dangerous world out there. And so rather than three guys on a camel, what you probably would have seen had you been standing there at the gates of Jerusalem as the Magi pulled in was a a long string of horses and camels and all kinds of other creatures bearing lots of people who looked exotic, they're foreigners from the east, who were dressed in exotic fashion, and who were heavily armed. Now you can see, with that in mind, why Herod got nervous when they showed up. There's a bunch of armed foreign magicians who turn up in his town, and they start asking really uncomfortable questions. Matthew says that all Jerusalem was troubled. And their uncomfortable question was this, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star in the east. Now here we run into the second kind of Christmas card myth. And the second Christmas card myth has to do with the star. It's, I mean, how how is it normally depicted, right? Normally you see this blazing light in the sky right over top, and they're following it. There's a few problems with this. If you really pay attention to to Matthew and you read this seriously, you notice a few things. First thing you notice is that no one other than the Magi seems to have noticed this thing, whatever it was. I mean, is anyone else following it? Does anyone else have the slightest clue what this is? And in fact, we know from the records of Chinese astronomers and Greek and Roman astronomers and naturalists, that that nobody else recorded anything unusual at this time. Which you would expect them to have done, right? If there's some big new blazing light in the sky. Nobody recorded anything unusual. Um, The second detail worth pointing out is that this star, whatever it was, and the Greek word that, that Matthew uses here is astera, and it can mean any sign in the heavens, this star, whatever it was, did not lead the Magi to Bethlehem, to the baby. The, the star led the Magi, the star led the Magi to Jerusalem, to the court of Herod the king. Now, that, none of this means that the star wasn't real. Far from it. Far from it. What it means, I think, and this is just, this is, now I'm, I'm speculating here, so bear with me. What it means, I think, is that whatever the Magi saw was something that only they would have understood. Now, I don't know what it was, whether it's a conjunction or whether it's some kind of astronomic event. I don't know. Whatever it was, it was something that only they understood and that they understood When they followed it, they were following it to pointing toward Judea, not necessarily toward Bethlehem. So they show up in Jerusalem at the court of Herod the king, the obvious place to ask for where a new prince is, and they say, we're here to see the child who's born king of the Jews. We've come to worship him. Only after that, Only after that, when they get to Jerusalem, what happens then? Well, Herod, we read, turns to his priests and his scribes, and he asks them. Herod knows exactly what these guys are after. Herod knows exactly what they're there for, and Herod asks his priests and his scribes, he says, okay, you know the scriptures, where's the Messiah supposed to be born? Bless you. And they go to him and they say, well... According to the fifth chapter of Micah, they don't say that, but they say, you know, yeah, in in the city of David, in Bethlehem. That's where the Messiah is going to be born. Now, you notice that only after that, only after they arrive, these magi arrive in Jerusalem, and only after they are told, only after they're told the prophecy that the Messiah is to be born in Bethlehem, only then do they set out for Bethlehem. 
And it's after they set out from Bethlehem that the star, in Matthew's words, goes before them and stands over the place where the child was. I have to tell you, I worked through this in, in both in English and Greek a bunch of times. I have no idea, honestly, what Matthew means by goes before and stands over. It's really mysterious language, but whatever it was, the whole point here is, and what I want you to notice, is that it might be that the study of the natural world, it might be that the study of creation got the Magi as far as Jerusalem, but it took the word of God to direct them to his son. And this is true for everybody, right? This is what Paul says in the first chapter of Romans. He says that, that the, the sheer knowledge of creation, if we look outside the windows of this building and we look at the world and we should see a few things in the world. We should see, hey, there's a world out there that came from somewhere. Where did it come from? Something doesn't come from nothing. And we can look at the world and we can say, look, this world has design, this world has purpose, this world is organized, and wait a minute, this looks like the work of an intelligent mind. This looks like the work of a designer. And if there's a creator, Paul says, Romans 1, if there's a creator, we should know that he's worthy of our worship because he made us. But guess what? All of that does not get us to the cross. That might get us to the point, if we were wise... It might get us to the point where we recognize that there is a God and he's worthy of our worship. It might even get us to the point that we know that there is a God, he's worthy of our worship, and we haven't worshipped him properly. But it doesn't get us to Jesus. For that, we need him to reveal himself. The skies got the Magi to Jerusalem. The word of God got the Magi to Jesus. And the, the third myth here that, that, okay, again, every depiction of this you'll ever see, every movie, it's about three and a half minutes after the kid's born that the Magi show up, right? I understand why you have to do that in a movie. I get it. But, notice a few details here. First, according to verse 11, that the Magi found Jesus not in the stable, not in the manger, that they found him in a house. Right? Mary and Joseph had settled in. And second, Herod's response to the news. Herod, we're told, summoned the Magi secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. Right? He sent them on their way. And, of course, Herod's idea was that he sent them on their way. They were supposed to come back to him, tell him where the child was, and then Herod could go and kill him. Very, very simple, Right? But the Magi were warned by God not to go back, and so they didn't return, at which point Herod launched into plan B. And plan B was to kill every child in Bethlehem, every male child in Bethlehem, under what age? Two. Absolutely. Now, it might be that, and if I were an evil genius, um, it might be that Herod was just trying to, to be safe, but I think it's a safe bet that that kid was months, if not a year or two old. So it's a good while later. Um, as for the child, I mean, you have to imagine this from the perspective of Mary and Joseph. It's one thing to have some friends over. It's one thing to have somebody drop by with a gift for the baby. But when you have a phalanx of armed foreigners that show up and want to see your baby. Honey, there's some sorcerers from the east here. <laughs> They'd like to see the child. I don't know how that's going to go over. Right? Um, Mary seems to have taken it all in stride anyway. And then something truly strange happens. These, these, these rich and powerful men, these heathen from the east, they drop to their knees and they worshipped Jesus. Why? I mean, the boy was clearly not Herod's heir right? Or even related to him, even if he had been. There are a lot of kings in the world. You don't have to go all the way to Bethlehem to find a king. What made this child so special? What did the Magi think they had found? Well, I'd suggest to you 
that the only plausible answer is that the Magi knew all along that they were looking for something more. That they knew all along they were looking for something more than just another king. They did not trek the wastes of Iraq and Syria to find any old baby. They came because in their studies, in their travels, they had run across the promise. They had run across the promise of a king, a son of David, a Messiah. They may not have been all that sure what that meant. But when they found the Lord in that house in Jerusalem, they knew what he was. The hope of the ages. Bright and morning star, the savior of the world. You can see that in their presence. I mentioned this to the kids, so I'm not going to belabor it. I'm not going to belabor it. But these were not your typical baby presents. Nobody brought them a blanket. Pack of diapers. Wipes. I know all about these things now. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm refreshed. Gold? I know, I mean, I like the gold. The gold's good, right? Classic, tasteful, useful. Um, handy for a, a young couple just starting out. As for frankincense, as for frankincense, I, I seriously doubt that Mary and Joseph had much use for it personally. But again, here's the thing. Frankincense is one of the principal ingredients in the oil and in the incense, both of them, that were used in the temple in Jerusalem by the priests. The, actually, the, the, there is, if you ever want to read it, in Exodus, there is the recipe for the incense that's used in the, in the inner sanctuary of the temple in Jerusalem. You can go ahead and make it at home. I have no idea what you'll do with it, but there you go. And frankincense is a, is a critical ingredient both of these gifts, gold and frankincense, are mentioned in Isaiah 60. We just read it. JT read it for us. Where the prophet says, Nations shall come to your light and kings to the brightness of your rising. They shall bring gold and frankincense and shall bring good news, the praises of the Lord. Gold is a gift for a king. Frankincense. Frankincense, a gift for, for a priest. Or, ultimately, what did the priests use it for? Ultimately, it's a gift for God. Right? The myrrh. The myrrh is the one that's not mentioned in the prophecy. I mentioned to the kids, the myrrh is a present for a dead man. The principal use of myrrh in the ancient world was as an ointment in funerary preparation. Funerary pre Is that a word? Funerary? I guess it is. You know what I mean, though. Preparing a body for burial. Preparing a body for burial. It was given to a child who was born to die for the sins of Israel and for the whole world. And why does Matthew tell us? Well, real simply. He's telling us this story to make sure we understand who that child is. And you know, a couple weeks ago, you celebrated Christmas. And I'm always amazed. I don't understand why people who don't believe in Jesus celebrate Christmas. It seems really weird to me. But they do. Matthew wants us to understand that that baby, that child who was born there in Bethlehem is not just some kid. He's not even a really nice guy. He's not even a great teacher. He is the rightful king of creation. He is the rightful king of creation who was there in the very beginning through whom all things were made. It says in the first chapter of John. He's not just a king, he's the king. He is himself. God in flesh. He is himself God in the flesh, the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory. The glory is of the only Son of the Father. And why did he come? He came. Not the only thing he came to do, but, but he came to die. He came to give his life for his people that everyone who believes in him 
should not die, but have everlasting life. This is who the child is. That's the point of the story. Praise God. Amen.